Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Morris. I'm the Director of Business Development for GTS Distribution, and I'm very excited to be here with a good friend and confidant, Jeff Tidball, who is the CEO of Atlas Games. You may know Atlas Games for Gloom, which I believe is in almost every single retailer I ever walk into in the United States or outside the United States. It is a super fun game. Today, we're going to be talking about two very unique products, and I say the keyword products because the first one is a game called God's Forge, which is a super cool dueling wizards dice game that we're going to talk about and card game. Uh, and we're also going to talk about a product called the White Box, which some of you may have seen or may not have seen, but it is a really inspirational and very unique product to have in the stores. So I don't want to steal too much of this thunder because he's got a lot to talk to you about. But in addition, just so everybody knows, we have a very special offer. As most of you who follow us or join us on the webinars know, we usually do a 52% discount on the products from Monday to Monday. So today is Monday, September 23rd. Next Monday is Monday, September 30th. You normally can pre-order or order either of the games we talk about for 52% off. You can still do that this week, but in addition to that, if you buy a minimum of five, you will also get a free unit to use in your store as a demo unit or just an additional free unit, which is awesome. So it's a great combination of savings both on the margin side and on the value side. So really appreciate Atlas for helping us support the retailers in that and really do appreciate everyone taking the time to come and join us today. Um, with that, I will remind everybody, everything's on the table. Any kind of questions you have, let us know. Um, there is a little chat window that you can open by hovering over your video and then clicking on the chat bubble. I'll go ahead and monitor that. Whenever you send a message in that, you can either choose to send it to all panelists, which are myself, Jeff, and Jessica, uh, our sales director, or you can send it to all panelists and attendees, and that will uh, have everyone who's part of the webinar be able to see that as well. So if you have any questions, let us know. We're always happy to answer them. But with that, I'm going to take my face that was made for radio. I'm going to let it be quiet, and Jeff, I will let you take over. <laughs> Scott, thank you. Um, hey, everybody. Thank you for logging on uh, this morning or this afternoon, wherever it is that you are in the world calling in from. Um, I guess, like Scott said, we want to talk about God's Forge, and then we want to talk about the white box. Feel free to leap in at any point with questions, but I'm just going to uh, jump in talking about God's Forge here. Um, so God's Forge is a two to four player game. It is another entry in the uh, Wizards desperately attempts to kill one another genre of gaming, which means that it is a little bit familiar to anybody who has played Magic or a game like that in your store. So it's accessible um, to existing gamers, but also there's not anything complicated going on here in terms of what is the story that is taking place. Um, God's Forge comes in a box like so, the uh, same size as our Cursed Court game. This is pretty close to, um, this may be exactly the same size as Azul, I guess. So this will go on a shelf like that. We have gotten some feedback that the depth of this is nice because this does not tip over forward on shelves. So it's a nice display size. Um, when you open up that box, it's got... Uh, Rules, obviously. The game board is relatively small. This is a very good demo table game. This fits very nicely on a 24-inch round cocktail table or on a, uh, a square table of the kind that we often see being used for demos in stores. It's a very easy walk-up and stand demo, in part because it uh, teaches very quickly the rest of the the gameplay is obvious from the way that you show the first turn. And that first turn has a tendency because of this sort of mini game that you play with these dice, which I'll show you in a second. It makes people feel smart as they play it. So let me show you how that goes. So this uh, board is just a little round thing. This is essentially a score tracker and it keeps the uh, deck set to go. Comes with a deck of cards. Um, Everybody's got a hands for perhaps wind up with a, a deck here. All of these guys, these uh, gem counters are called veil stones. They set up here. Score trackers, one per player color. They'll start at a different place on here depending on how many players you've got. Um, we usually will start a demo game of this at 12 life because that will keep it going faster. So if you do wind up with this set up on a demo table, we recommend starting at 12 here. I know that it's hard to see all those numbers around from my uh, phone that's sitting away a little bit far up, but that's how we often set those up. So then each player in these same color counters gets four dice that are relatively nice. These have all got a little metallic swirl baked into them there. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but the table presence is pretty nice. I'm not going to pull all of these out of here. 
Um, the other thing that we do when we set up demos is just put a reference card onto the table next to all the players. So let me just clear this guy out of here and make sure that you can see these. How easy is it to see the text and numbers on those? Is that a complete disaster? How does that no, look? Actually, it, it does come through pretty well. The numbers on the circular board are a little tiny to see, um, but I think if my eyes are not deceiving me, it looks like the upper right card has a seven and a three. Is that right? Uh, two and a three. Two and a three. Okay, close. And then five and 11 on the one. Yep. yep. So Super good. As long so, as you don't have 46-year-old eyesight like Scott, you're good. <laughs> as long as you're not watching it from many states away across video conference. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, so these cards represent the things that you can do in the game in this duel. We are in the fiction um, wizards who showed up in the morning to battle for the last place in the world that magical power seeps through. So we are all trying to control the God's Forge. That is why the name of this game. Um, each one of these things is a spell that you can cast or a creation that you can summon. So these top two are uh, creations. All creations have an illustration. That's something that's going to sit in front of you and continue dealing damage to your neighbor, neighbor until it gets destroyed or you get destroyed. Uh, even if they get destroyed, it will start dealing damage to the next guy around. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then these ones down here that have a gold pattern on them and have a gold outline around their name, those are spells. They are going to fire once and then go back to the discard pile. So two different kinds of cards that you can uh, cast. So each one of these has over in the left-hand side sort of the recipe for the elements that you need in order to cast it. And these all refer back to the dice that you roll. So at the beginning of your turn, uh, the first thing that you're gonna do is make what we call a forge roll and then collect up these results kind of to see what you've got. And this is where this little mini game that I talked about comes in. Um, because this is a little bit Yahtzee style. You've got three ways to improve your die roll, and the ways that you improve your die roll kind of make you feel smart as you are going, because even though the recipes for casting spells seem a little bit difficult, there are different ways that you can combine and recombine the dice such that you can nearly always, I say 85, 90, 95% of the time, cast something that is useful. Usually it is the thing that you wanted to cast. So let me show you how that goes. So I got here uh, two, two, four, and six. The numbers that I'm trying to get are the ones in the upper left-hand corner of the card. So this chaos ring here requires a two and a three on the dice in order to get done. Now these dice can also be combinations of dice. So this could be a two for the two and a one and a two for the three because I can add the one and the two together. Now I can't reuse that same two. The, each die can only be used once, but different ways that I can make those numbers up. The Celestine shield here takes a five and then it takes an 11 plus. So that 11 plus is always going to be a combination of dice that add up, but I do not have to hit that 11 exactly. That is an 11 or better. Uh, this Channel Veilstone spell just takes a die that's got a four on it. And then this Banish is a uh, illustration of different ways that you can have stuff. This one requires two even dice and two odd dice. So the actual results on the dice don't matter. It's just that you've got two of them that are even numbers and two of them that are odd numbers. So then three ways that I can make my dice better. So this one, I can cast this Channel Veilstone straight up. I've got a four already. And this one actually has an ability that says I can play another card this round. Uh, normally you're restricted to playing one card per round, but because this one has that special ability, if I can get these three dice to come up with one of these other combinations, I could play two uh, cards this round. Now that's obviously not going to work with the Banish. I've only got three dice remaining, and this one is going to take four dice no matter what. There are ways I can get a fifth die. There's actually an artifact I can cast that will give me this black die and get me five. So that would be a cool thing that you can do, and new players love to get that fifth die. But uh, for sure, this chaos ring I could do with a two and a three. So my first tool for improving my uh, roll of my forge roll is that I get two re-rolls. And a re-roll is just I point to one die and I roll it again. It's not a Yahtzee style re-roll of all the dice that you have left. So in this case, I might want to re-roll one of these twos in the hopes that I can turn it into a three. So I can just pick that up and re-roll it. And there, magic for the Monday morning webinar. Now I can cast these two. This is actually like one of the best results that I could possibly get because let me march on to kind of what the second way that you can improve your role is and that's through um, Veil Stones. So that's these guys over here. These I'm going to accumulate over the course of the game and I can spend them to add or subtract one from any existing die. 
So if I had had one of these before, I could actually just have spent that to make my two into a three, because two plus one is three, obviously. The reason I bring that up now is because sixes are how you get veil stones. So if I have any sixes that I did not use for something else, I can just spend this three to get a veil stone for future use. So that's why this is a particularly good roll. It's gonna let me cast a channel veil stones and a chaos ring and get me a veil stone that I can use on some later turn when my dice are not helping me out. Good so far? Um, the last thing is that ones are wild. So if I've got a one in that mix, I can use that one for any other result that I need. So if this three had turned into a one instead of into a three, it's just as good for me. I can use that one to become a three and do that same stuff that I was talking about before. So anytime you're re-rolling trying to get a specific result, a one is just as good, which is kind of nice. And a one can also become a six and get you a veil stone which is uh, pretty great as well. And so you can sort of see as I'm talking through this, how players solve a relatively easy little logic puzzle, but get the result that they want, get some cards in play and feel very smart within 30, 40 seconds of walking up to your demo table, which is why we, we find that this is a particularly good demo game. So we um, learned that all of the copies that are demo copies do come with loaded dice like Jeff just rolled so that they will always roll what you want. <laughs> that is correct. That is guaranteed. And I will come to your store and re-roll any dice that do not. Uh, that Big giant want. asterisk on that one, but yes. <laughs> all right. So one of the other great things about God's Forge is that it is not turn-based particularly. So everyone is doing this mini game of dice rolling all at the same time. You've got your hand of four cards in front of you and everybody just sits there and rolls their dice and does their re-roll. So if Scott and I are playing, he can be doing this at the same time that I am doing this and kind of seven wonders style. We are all thinking about what we want to do um, rather than I'm waiting for him to think and then he's waiting for me to think. It is not fun to watch someone else think. Newsflash. Um, so once everyone has got the cards that they want to play, you just put that card face down in front of you. And I like to kind of stack the dice on top of it to show that I am done. Once we look around the table and realize that everybody is in this state, we can just turn them over. Now in a demo, I like to talk through how did I spend those dice so that people see what actually happened. But once you wind up with experienced players, there is no call to do that. Everybody just flips their stuff over and carries on. Um, these little eye icons, those are reveal phase abilities, and so that is the next thing that happens up here. Everybody does a reveal effect if they has, have one. For example, this channel Veilstone one gives me two Veilstones that I can use later. Um, then the next thing is the attack phase. This is another place where I think God's Forge shines because, again, there is not waiting for turns. Everybody attacks the player to their left. Everybody defends against the player to their right. These uh, red numbers are damage that you deal. This chaos ring happens to deal random damage. That's the only card like that in the game. So you just roll a die, and this turn it's going to deal five. This Celestine shield, uh, the blue numbers are a defense against the player to your right. This one also has a special uh, empower ability. I can pay a veil stone to increase its damage by one. So there are some other uses for these veil stones in addition to helping out with your forge roll. But then the math is very straightforward. We just deal damage around the table and adjust the tracks however they need to be adjusted. The nice thing about this uh, simultaneous, so it allows simultaneous attacks around the table. So again, there's no waiting. You just talk to the person on your left, talk to the person on your right and adjust the stuff. The other nice thing about that is there is no king making in this game. We can't gang up on somebody and attempt to destroy them, which usually leaves a bad taste in people's mouths. But then also we don't have to wait for people to decide if they want to gang up or puzzle about who they want to attack or wait for somebody else to decide who they're going to attack. We just do this all simultaneously, which makes the game uh, feel very fast and actually does make it very fast. Full games of this do not take very long at all. Um, so that is more or less it. Once we have dealt damage, there's an upkeep phase. Some cards require a very quick upkeep, but basically as soon as you've launched an attack and everybody's done their damage, uh, everybody can go right back to rolling their dice once they've uh, drawn back up to their hand size. Game goes on until there's only one player left. One of the nice things about the end game is that as soon as one player dies, 
Everyone else who is alive is going to take extra damage every turn. We inflict seven extra damage on all the survivors as the God's Forge storm intensifies so that that one player who is knocked out of the game does not have to sit around watching their friends play games without them. So we almost always discover that a game ends the turn after someone gets knocked out. Maybe once in 20 games or so, it will go on two turns past that. It is possible for everyone to die on the last turn. The rules specify in that case that you are keeping track of who dies the least and that uh, wizard's ashes are packed into a box and sent off to their family in glory. So that's uh, good times as well. So that is, that is God's Forge. Is that, have there any questions shown up in the uh, chat there at all or does anyone have any? There haven't been any questions that showed up in chat yet. Just as a reminder, if you do want to ask any questions, if you hover over your video window, there's a little chat bubble at the bottom. You can pull that up and then type anything in. Um, one of the things that I've really liked about this, I've had a chance to play this game a couple of times. We talked a little bit about this last week when we were talking, Jeff, is that it's it, the whole genre of dueling wizards usually comes with a cost of having to learn all the cards and learn how to make a deck and learn how to customize a deck and spend almost an entire like afternoon just learning how to play the game, getting ready to play. And then hopefully what you've learned turns into a strategic deck and turns into a strategic outcome. Because with God's Forge, it's nothing that you have to sit down and learn everything from because you only have the certain cards in your hand and the abilities are going to be very clear to you once you, you pull those four cards and start playing with the dice from your hand. So it's actually struck me as one of the very few games in this genre that is super, super fast to pick up and super fast to teach, which ironically turned into last week, I was traveling to Las Vegas uh, and Little Shop of Magic actually had this on display in their store when I walked in. They had a big table. They were actually down to one unit because he said that they've been demoing it on their thing and they've been selling through their units so fast, um, which is really cool. But it was, it was super fast and super easy to teach the guy I was with. I was like, this is what you do. These are the cards, roll the dice, boom, you're off and running. And it was like very, very quick. So it struck me as a great game for a demo game for sure. Yeah, one of the things, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, one of the things about all drawing from a common deck is actually that you have kind of strategic options that are not yours alone, but there are strategic questions to be answered about which way you want to approach. Starting with defense is a very different approach to starting with offense. Oftentimes we recommend that people do not do spells in the early game, but that is certain, certainly a strategy. So you are not drawing cards from that deck and having that completely dictate what it is that you're going to do in the game. But the fact that you do not have set up and two hours of brain burning card selection beforehand, or a 45 minute draft before you can start to play or whatever, um, is a is a nice feature of this one. Absolutely is. Yeah, uh, the other thing, break down barriers to entry is always good. <laughs> yeah, the other thing that is interesting about this game that is not necessarily obvious, but if you sit down and break one of these open and play it with your staff a little bit uh, and play full games, you'll notice that the sort of power ramp turn by turn is very dramatic and fun. The first couple turns of the game. Um, might make it seem like a game is going to last 12, 13, 14 turns. In fact, they almost always go six or seven turns. Rarely do they go eight. Because as these uh, creations start to add up in front of you, you do geometrically progressing damage every turn because there's a lot of ways to get damage on the table. There are not all that many ways to kill other people's creations. There are some, but the uh, power ramp is, makes the game feel very dramatic. It's fun because you feel like you are getting better and better. And then five turns in, suddenly the guy to your right is doing you 25 points of damage and your eyes open a little bit and you're like, oh, that can happen in this game. <laughs> that happened to me in my first game. I was playing Travis, your, your sales director, and we were playing a gamma. And it was, you know, very like, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. And he's like, oh, uh, you take 19. And I'm like, whoa, what? <laughs> it, was like, it was really quick. but it was That's awful. not a thing, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Well, should we move on to white box stuff then? Yeah, by all means. And, and of course, if anyone does have any questions or you haven't been able to take it fast enough, just feel free to let us know. We can always come back to God's Forge for sure. But this is definitely one that, you know, with that buy five, get, get one free at the 52% off is a great one to put onto a demo table to be able to teach people. We have not had uh, anyone come to us that has regretted having done that when we offered it at the Gamma Trade Show. Awesome. All right, so the white box, uh, like Scott was saying earlier, is kind of a 
different thing. This is a game design workshop in a box. It is not a game per se. Uh, this is a, a, a product that we put into the channel on the premise that everyone has an idea for a game. Um, when I lived in Los Angeles, I heard a statistic that if you go to Hollywood and just randomly ask people on the street, uh, how's your screenplay going? About 80% of them will start to tell you how their screenplay is going and what is in it. So it, it, everybody in Hollywood is working on a script. And by the same token, if you were to start asking people that come into the store, how is that game design coming? It is my hunch that as many as 60, 70% of them will just leap in and start telling you about the game idea that they have in mind. So I, I guarantee you that there are game designers in your store, and this is a great way to uh, engage with them. Um, so what it is, is that uh, there's essentially two parts to this, and they work together, and our hope the way they work together is to get people to actually design games. It's one thing to read a book about game design and then not know where to go next, but um, this is, is engineered to actually get people to design games. So what's in here is a ton of things that you might use to design a game and then a book about how to do it. So it's got three uh, sheets of punch board here. They are all different. This last one's got nothing on it. This is for the person who buys the box to start making up the tokens that their theirs needs. This one's got a couple of uh, empty ones, but it's also got just a bunch of things that might be useful in all kinds of games. So like location markers and crosshairs and things that are on fire. Uh, five different colors of things. These are set up for color buying players to also know what's going on because those five also have different uh, shapes on them that make it easy to see. Stuff like a first player token and attacks and defenses and kind of whatever a player can imagine. These are engineered to be very useful for all kinds of different game designs. So it's got three of those. Um, and then the next thing up is this essay book. I'm going to set that aside for a sec, but then it's just got all kinds of cubes and dice and meeples and big cubes and discs and all kinds of nonsense. So this is a 200 or so plastic discs in six different colors plus gold and silver, a bunch of cubes, not desiccated. We got silica gel in all these. It's like a bonus. Huge cubes, good for remembering what color each given player is or for special locations on the board. It's got a ton of meeples in all of those colors again. And then the dice actually come in all of those same colors in case there is a place where each player needs them or where there's a worker placement mechanic where the die results can only control certain meeples or whatever. And then the guy who created this insisted that we put a ton of little bags in there because he is always upset that he does not have enough bags, so there are plenty of extra bags. All this stuff just packs down in here very easily. So let me come back to this book. This book is just over 200 pages long. It's got 25 different essays in it about different facets of trying to design a game and publish it. So where do my ideas come from? Is it safe to tell my idea to other people or are they gonna knock me down and steal it? How do I play test that to make sure that it is good? How do I uh, attempt to pitch this game to publishers? If I decide I wanna kickstart this game, uh, how do I go about that? Is that dangerous and creepy? How do I go to a convention and attempt to demo my game to gamers to see if they will like it? There's an essay on uh, making sure that your components and design are accessible to people with all different kinds of abilities. So this is intended to provide a ton of information and then be immediately useful to people who want to design a game. So the goal is really to get them to make the game. It says on the back, uh, get the idea out of your head and onto the table. And that is kind of the way we like to pitch this. So one of the things, uh, oh, so the other thing is, the thing that is uh, important to us about this, this is a $30 MSRP. And we do not get a particularly incredible margin on this product because there's so much stuff in it for 30 bucks. But we thought it was extremely important that anybody who has the interest in designing a game picks this up and has absolutely no barrier to buying it. As soon as they start to think about what is a cube really worth? Can I buy a cube on the internet for cheaper than a penny? Um, can I maybe get the digital version? At that point, we feel like we have lost them. We would like them to pick this up, uh, agree that they do have an idea for a game and head immediately to the cash register to buy it rather than having any uh, reservations about that at all. So we think that this price point is extremely compelling. We set this after asking a ton of retailers what they think 
the best price for this game is. So that is another thing that we think is a huge selling point for this particular one. We see huge sales of this uh, around the holidays because it is a uh, extremely good gift for someone else. And it's a gift that parents and grandparents can feel very good about giving because it is a creative gift. It gets kids um, moving in the idea of making their own things as opposed to whatever the antisocial behavior of the hour is. <laughs> so um, that is another thing that we really like about this particular product and why we think that it uh, sells pretty well at the holidays. One other thing that, that some retailers have told me they find compelling about this is that it is a great way to get 20 minutes back when a customer comes in and wants to tell you about their game design. You can say, hold it right there. I have the thing for you. And then they give you $30 and you get your 20 minutes back. So um, <laughs> that is value. another uh, advanced <laughs> retail trick that we have seen go on with the white box. Yeah, uh, one of the things that uh, I saw a retailer do recently with the white box, it was about maybe two or three months ago, um, but it was really cool. They actually held a workshop with it. Um, they have a monthly designer meeting where uh, a bunch of local designers will come. Usually it's a case of one designer is pitching their idea to others and then getting feedback from them. Um, and what they decided to do was they decided to use the white box as a competition thing where they offered them a small discount for purchasing directly from the store. And then everyone had to make their game using everything in the white box. Um, I thought that was really cool because it was a way to, you know, not just use the product as it was intended, but do it in a community setting where you're building up more and more from those people who, like you said, everyone's got a manuscript or everyone's got a screenplay and everyone's got a game design for sure. Yeah, when we know of stores that do um, in school activities with this, one that does a gifted and talented program where every student in the place uh, buys one of these or gets it through that program. Uh, which comes through the store and are able to teach game design in a school setting to kids who are eager to learn it using this as kind of the second piece of that. And, and now I have a new challenge. Now I want to use my white box to not just design a game, but I want to use the silica gel with it since you mentioned it. <laughs> That's right. Do not eat, Scott, though. It's Do not eat. Like, no. <laughs> yes, not. It's not good. That's not good. Now, this is definitely a creative creative item, and it's something you, know, you touched on a little bit around the, the gift for the holidays. It is it is a great idea from a holiday perspective. And even though we're only in September, it's right around the corner for holidays right now. So if this is something that, you know, the retailers are looking for as a, as a good opportunity for the holidays, that special of the 52% off and then the buy five, get one is a great opportunity as well. And it, it would blow my mind if there is any store that cannot move six of these by the end of the year through the Christmas season. We've got a store we know of in Cambridge, Minnesota, where 8,000 people live that did four of these last year. So it, it really is um, interesting to nearly everyone who has an interest in playing games to design them. Well, you know, Jeff, I mean, Cambridge, Minnesota is the mecca of all entertainment and board games. So. That's, that's absolutely <laughs> correct. Clearly, they had an advantage where they were. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. The only the other um, tip that I got that was interesting from a store owner is that he likes to stock this next to Gloomhaven and Scythe and other games that everyone wishes they had designed. So <laughs> if there is stuff in your store that all of the alphas uh, believe, if only they had gotten there a moment earlier, uh, they would be rolling in the cash and uh, so forth. Um, stock this next to those games. Um, to let people draw that connection on their own with where their game design might go. Um, Ashton had a really good question. Uh, asked, uh, are there plans for a bigger white box, maybe a blank or blank-ish game board or two possibly to add in? We have talked about doing additional um, follow-on white boxes. One of the things that we have been suggesting to folks in the meantime is actually that you can start up a small kind of game design area in your store, either an end cap or a shelf or something like that. There are a number of publishers, we don't, but we recommend other folks just track down the places that make uh, blank cards or blank boards. Um, the Tower Games in Minneapolis put in a game design section uh, and I've actually got, it's funny that you brought up Little Shop of Magic because I use a photo from his store when I do a presentation on this because he's got a really good setup that he did for his game design section where there's a white box headlining that and then he's got boards and cards and a bunch of books yep. that are about game design. Um, the Tower Games in Minneapolis anyway set this up 
And they discovered that the role players in that store buy blank cards like nobody's business. So that was not even the intention of putting that stuff in their store. But uh, they use those for magic items or for equipment and things like that uh, in their gameplay. So bringing that product in, in addition to kind of being a care and feeding of game designers item in your store, may also sell to, to people coming through that you did not even consider. So using this to headline a game design section uh, in your store is something that people have had some success with. And if there's any keyword that I constantly hear when I talk to retailers, it's the word unique. It, it's they, they look for products or games that stand out separate themselves from the shelf from the shelf and everything that's on it so that's that's a great combination for that awesome love Excellent. it um there's been no additional questions so uh just as a quick reminder for everyone um between this week and next week uh you're going to be able to get 52 percent off msrp whether you buy one or whether you buy five uh, but if you do buy five of either game god's forge or uh the white box and again white box is not a game itself it's a chance for you to make your game um, but if you buy at least five of each of those at 52% off, then you'll get an additional unit for free. So that's a great opportunity for you to either gain more margin as a retailer or be able to use them as demos like we talked about. Um, as mentioned, both of them are great things to have out on the table, especially, you know, at this time of year when lots of new foot traffic is coming in, lots of holiday traffic is coming in, and people are very peaked to spend their 30 or $40 on a gift for their friend or for their family or anything like that. So it's a great opportunity. And again, I'd like to really thank Jeff and Atlas for helping us support that from a financial perspective to make that a great offer for all the retailers. Awesome. With that, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have for right now. Jeff, do you have any final parting comments at all? No, go out and make games. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for joining us. Really do appreciate the time. Atlas is a great partner, great games. If you're not familiar with Atlas, by the way, I would recommend just definitely taking some time on GTS's website. You can just type in Atlas Games. You can see all the games that we carry from their catalog. It's a very long, very thick catalog that'll provide a lot of fun. Gloom. You don't have gloom, man. Get gloom. <laughs> that's a that's a game of all flavors and kinds that belongs in almost every store. I, I'm not kidding. That I, I really cannot think of a retailer that doesn't have gloom in their store because it is also such a really easy game to teach and such a fun kind of tongue in cheek kind of comedy thing to it with trying to kill your relatives and, and have them have the worst days possible. It's a super, super thing to have in the stores. So. If you have been stocking gloom, uh, Gloom of Thrones has a street date of December first. Sean Wainwright just said, can't wait for Gloom, Gloom of Thrones to make awesome. it into our promo card. That's awesome. awesome. That's good stuff. That is good stuff. Well, Jeff, again, thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, retailers, just in case you missed anything, we will have this recorded and posted and put up on YouTube later today. So stay tuned to social media for all the information about that. And also, as always, retailers, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate your time, taking the time to learn about these products and take advantage of the offers that we are partnering with Atlas to bring you. So. With that, everyone have a wonderful week. Have a great time in your stores, and thank you so much. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody.